Great. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for coming to the eScience Institute Community Seminar um, today. Um, we're delighted to have Joseph Hellerstein um, presenting a talk today. Um, Joseph is a um, senior data science fellow with the eScience Institute, as well as an eScience data scientist um, and an affiliate professor um, in the um, Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. Um, today, he's going to be talking to us about check your model, <laughs> model testing accuracy and reproducibility. Um, and this, like Wu Sub Shin, who was actually a former one of our Data Science for Social Good fellows and then continued on working with Joe as a, a co-author on this presentation. So that's great to see too. Um, Joe, do you wanna take it from here? Okay, well, thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, first of all, um, I'm used to getting a little more audience feedback. And so if you feel comfortable, at least at the beginning part with going to video, I appreciate it. I, I have, we're not, we don't have a chat up, but what I'm going to look for is like thumbs up, thumbs down or waves or something like that. So first of all, a little bit of context and trying to get a feeling for those of you who do, do something in the way of, of building predictive models, either regression or classification models. So, you know, this, uh, you know, for whatever you're in, whatever discipline, thumbs up if, if modeling is a key part of what you're doing. Okay, excellent. So just about everybody. How, how many folks are doing stuff with um, uh, models of differential uh, systems of differential equations? Is that part of uh, some of the work you do? Okay, a little bit. More machine learning kinds of things? Classification primarily? Okay, all right, yeah, a little mix. All right, great. So uh, that's really what I was trying to get a sense for. If you, if you prefer to not let me see where you are or who you're with, you're happy to go video. Otherwise, you know, any sort of visual feedback is always appreciated. Okay, so. Oh, and Joe, I'll just pipe in because I realized I forgot to say, um, we will do questions at the end and you can use, if you want to ask a question, you can use the raise hand function. Um, so that I can see that you have a question um, and I'll, I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself to do the question. Um, we can potentially try and do that during the talk, but um, you know, if you really have a burning question, maybe Joe, we could allow, you know, and I see that pop up, I'll, I'll interrupt if it seems appropriate, but um, otherwise we'll probably just hold most of the questions to the end. Um, okay, yeah, and that's fine, Sarah. I probably won't be paying close attention to the um the gallery oh no you, so i'll, I'll make sure it. yeah i'll yeah, watch the gallery that, awesome. and yeah I'll, I'll handle okay. that yeah okay 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 thanks right. so so in sarah's intro um i think she gave you a feeling from my background um my phd is in computer science most of my career so 30 plus years i was in industry about 20 years at ibm research and then 10 years in in in, in engineering at uh, both uh, microsoft and google and so this will sort of come through a bit um, as um, I go through this talk, because that's sort of the software engineering kind of perspective on, uh, on things. Uh, the last um, five years or so, I've been primarily doing computational biology, and that will be pretty clear as well as we go through this. So you know, what really got me excited about um, this uh, biology just a second, let me move your picture around just a little bit, Sarah. I was blocking something here. I mean, it, it, to me, it's absolutely amazing what's happened to um, biology over about the last uh, 20 or 30 years, going from a descriptive science to a quantitative science. And, and the number of possibilities that present themselves in terms of us being able to manipulate biology is really astonishing. So I'm sure these are things that you know you all are probably familiar with. This notion of precision medicine, we're based on the particulars of our genome, and uh, both epigenetics, its genome state, we could uh, potentially better target drugs. Um, I think it's fascinating potential in materials, living materials. So you might, you know, um, uh, a, a material might not just be something static, you know, because in biology materials are, you know, like a cell wall is not static. It's constantly changing. It might be something that also has control elements in it too. But to, to get to this kind of future, um, we need to have a lot of understanding about how our biology works. And I'll tell you, you know, what I'm going to deal with is one element of getting to that future, this notion of, you know, if we could really model with precision, you know, what sort of environments we would need, what sort of, you know, testing and control we need around that. But of course, we're very far from having that kind of detailed understanding, even, even models of cells. Um, 
are, are sort of out of our reach at this point. We do modest pathways. Um, so what I'm going to do is sort of take a step back and you know, make this a little more general. I know some of you folks, this is where it'd be nice to be able to see more of, of you know, your faces to get a sense of what's resonating right now. In many uh, disciplines of physical science, the notion of mass transformation is central. So it's certainly in physics, where um, you may take matter and turn it to energy or energy into matter, um, in mechanics as well, um, and definitely just about any aspect of chemistry. Uh, that's that's central. And so, of course, our underlying biology is largely electrical and chemical. Most I'm going to be dealing with chemical right now. And so this notion of mass transformation is essential if we want to get to this future of being able to construct mechanistic models of our, our biology. Um, and so basically you have some sort of input structure and you're transforming it to an output structure. And a simple of that example of this is if we take uh, methane and combine it with oxygen, we can end up with CO2 and water. And um, we see that we, we've transformed a, a, you know, a one organization of these atoms, you know, methane and CO2, uh, methane and oxygen into uh, another organization of the same atoms. And that's, that's really the kind of transformation I'm talking about. These kinds of models, although they're much more complicated in biology because the uh, uh, molecular structures are, are much, much bigger. But, but this notion of these transformations is central to any sort of, of mechanistic model of a biological system. So let's talk a little bit about where we are with constructing these kinds of mechanistic models. So today, you take, this is, I'll, I'll get back to what this model is about a little bit later. It's uh, any of you who've taken my software uh, engineering course would say, egad, if I wrote software codes like that, you know, I would fail. And that's actually one of the questions I have for some of the biological models too. Why are you using such obscure names and notations? But in any case, this is current state of the art for, for biological models. Um, each one of these lines that begins with a, a name here like V8 colon, that's the name of a reaction. This is a reaction. These are the reactants. In this case, I guess we could have said 2C10, but that's not what the modeler chose to do. Um, that goes to another um, another molecule C11, and so on down. And so we have what these are referred to as reactants and these are the products. And typically today um, in biological models, you see between 100 and the biggest model I think I've seen was 10,000 reactions. Uh, some, it's a, a model of metabolism um, in, in a, uh, I believe in uh, a bacteria, in E. coli. So that's, that's the biggest I've ever seen, uh, at least in current, um, current state of the art. So how does this, so again, I mentioned that I'm, you know, sort of my perspective is, you know, sort of a computer science kind of perspective. And if I put this on my computer science hat and say, you know, where does this stack up in terms of, you know, what's gone on in the history of computer science, I'd say we're about in the 1960s. You know, where, you, you know, you have somebody in a suit probably, you know, trained at, I, you know, at some IBM school and works in front of a big piece of iron and has a teletype and writes codes that are between 100 and 10,000 lines. And this happens to be a piece of COBOL. And, and I don't know how many of you have ever heard of COBOL. Actually, it's in big demand. If you want to do something and make your money right away, learn COBOL because uh, all the COBOL programmers are dead or dying. So, and they still have a lot of running COBOL codes. But uh, other than that, if you want an exciting future, stick with data science. So, in any case, so that's about what, you know, where we are today and uh, where we are today in terms of biological models. So, of course, today in software, you know, decent sized software codes, you know, take something like Linux or Apache Web Server, server you're talking about millions of lines, possibly tens of millions of lines. So, we've made this, you know, what? You know, th a thousand fold or so uh, increase in complexity over the last 50 or 60 years. So how, how did we do this in software? What were the keys to doing that? Because I'm looking at this as sort of potentially some kind of a guide as to what we need to do with biological models to get us to this future where we can actually engineer biological systems. So my observation, and everybody will have their, their own uh, perspective on this is that we developed a set of best practices. I mean, like if you take my software engineering course, you'll know what, you know, what I believe the best practices are in particular for how you design things and how you test things. Um, and the other thing we did is we developed a bunch of tools 
so that we could facilitate these best practices. And that is sort of my jumping off, off point on this, on this talk, is so this notion of sort of beginning thinking about what are the tools we need so that we can greatly increase the complexity of our models because um, we probably need something more like a, you know, it's probably closer to a million fold increase in complexity because we, we don't want to just model cells. I mean, we want to model tissues and organs, whole organisms that, you know, are, you know, multicellular, very complicated. So, um, yeah, we need, we need this uh, in probably in a much more sophisticated way than what was done with software. Um, so this goes back to this notion about, you know, what do we, you know, we want, we want to be able to build on this notion about how we get accurate, understandable and reproducible models. So um, sort of a negative example of this about when you, you know, you built your model wrong. I don't know how many of you folks, I can't see your hands, I can't see your faces. So, you know, just imagine that I'm looking, um, are familiar with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Um, this was a lesson in, uh, you know, ignoring eigenvalues and when you're doing you know, bridge construction. Bridges in the late 1800s and early 1900s, that was the place to be. Building bridges if you were an engineer, that was the exciting thing that was going on. And there were a lot of lessons that were accumulated over time. Uh, some of them very costly. This one is a much later date, of course, but um, people learned over time to develop systematic techniques. So this grew to a thought, this broader thought about trying to apply the lessons of software engineering to building biomedical models. Uh, biomedical models. Uh, there's a paper that I co-authored with some others in um, the um, bioengineering, School of Bioengineering here at, on campus. Um, and uh, sort of draws out some of the implications here. I'm going to focus on one part of this, which is an element of testing. And um, that may seem like it's, you know, sort of boring and uninteresting. Um, I think as we dig into it, not only is it important from the point of view of creating, you know, reproducible models and models that are accurate, but there's also some interesting mathematics that sort of comes out of this that, uh, you know, you might find intriguing. So error detection in software, how do we do that? Well, basically two broad approaches. One of them is you can run, error, you can run the codes and see if you get an error. Um, and there are various different ways you could do this. You gotta do it as operation, that's not good practice. But hopefully you have a set of tests and you've heard the term unit test, hopefully. And that's the way you could do it. And so, you know, if you're on Windows, you might get something like this. Hopefully you get it a little more automated. The other thing that you can do with software, which is widely done, uh, and this is part of the tool set that we've developed over probably most likely the last 30 years, is this notion of static error checking and the concept of what's called a linter, something like um, PyLint is an example for Python. What it does is it looks at your codes and determines if there's an error without running anything. It's just the structure of the codes. And one example of this is if you assign a value to a variable before you reference that variable, that's clearly a problem. And so uh, there are other things that linters will do um, in terms of formats and uh, uh, compliance with, for example, documentation standards. Anyway, here's an example of a linter in practice, uh, the kind of thing this kind of tool would do. Here's a Python linter, and it would say, look, you know, you, you said that you're going to, this is a new Python block, you have to indent here, and apparently initially they didn't indent, and then they did over there. Okay, anyway, that is my, my launching point for what I'm gonna discuss right now in terms of applying this concept of a linter to mechanistic models for um, biological systems, in particular for reaction-based models. So reactions like the kinds of things we looked at before. Okay, so here is um, going back to that initial reaction we saw with uh, methane and, and uh, molecular oxygen. So we've got the reactants and the products. And if we want to talk about one approach to, to checking the correct, the, what, to make sure that this, this reaction is, um, doesn't have an error in it. So one kind of error is this notion of what we call mass balance. And mass balance means that all the atoms on the reactant side correspond to an atom on the product side and the reverse as well. So we've got an equal, we account for both sides. So we would do is we would on the reactant side do an accounting of each atom. We've got some carbon, we've got hydrogen, we've got oxygen, do the same accounting on the product side. And we'd say, gee, are they equal? 
And this sounds like a pretty straightforward process. Um, it's very intuitive, but there are a number of implications uh, of it, uh, in particular for biological systems where um, molecules are, uh, you have a large number of molecules that are quite large. I mean, you know, here we've got methane over here with five atoms and, you know, uh, you know, two, uh, you know, two molecular oxygens. So we've got four there. I mean, these are relative, really small molecules. Biological systems, 10,000 atoms, not uncommon. Um, they're in different states. They actually will change pretty dramatically. You get add protons or a methyl group or acetyl group. These things will go back and forth. They'll even fluctuate. So exactly the, the exact molecular formula for um, a large molecule is sort of it depends. Um, and that's one of the challenges. So, you know, if you want to do this kind of thing, you have to work with the exact atomic formula. If I say it's sort of like about, you know, four hydrogens with the methane, you know, then how do I do the accounting? I don't know if I've made a mistake in my formula. Uh, although there are representations of molecules that are probabilistic, it's just potentially not useful if you're trying to do this kind of error checking. So that's the issue with uh, um, it coming up with, with the exact atomic formula. Another issue, which is a little more subtle, is that many reactions, chemists will assume that certain molecules are present in the environment. So in particular, if you're working with solutions, you know, anything that is in like water, um, it's assumed that there, you know, you may assume that there's some protons around, maybe there's some methyl groups around, um, could be a lot of other things, you just have uh, um, uh, some uh, phosphates as well. Um, it could be that with many of these that, um, you know, the chemist knows that that's what's in solution, it doesn't explicitly include them. This approach by using the exact molecular formula requires that you give all chemical details and that can become a burden uh, for someone who's writing a model because those details, you know, get to be very tedious. And then the last is, and this is to some degree a bit of a summary of the other two, if you're working in units of atoms, that's a really low level of detail. And it can make it pretty hard to figure out whether where an error lies. For example, if the result of this kind of atomic mass analysis for you know some sort of enzymatic, uh, some sort of catalysis involves a, an enzyme, a protein, which you know could be you know a few thousand atoms in it. You know, if if somehow you forgot part of the protein, you expressed it wrong, and you come up with this accounting of maybe a few hundred atoms that you're missing. How do you figure out where your error is? Which one of the reactants or the products either lost or gained mass unexpectedly? So, um, so that becomes a problem as well. All right, so that's this, this atomic mass analysis, which is um, a fairly common approach uh, today in, when people build these models, assuming they can do um, get the, the exact uh, atomic formulas. So, Another way of dealing with this, um, and this is where I'm going to introduce some, some new ideas I've, I've injected with my colleague Wu Sub Shin, uh, reference the month in a paper recently submitted to an informatics journal, is to work, think more like a chemist. So a chemist would think in terms of functional groups or what are called moieties. It's a part of a molecule that has, you know, typically it has a chemical function. It doesn't have to, but it's at least a grouping of atoms. And so um, here, here, this part here, this is um, the, 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 for those of you who are less familiar with some of these uh, chemical line drawings. So anything without a name on it is a carbon. Um, and uh, carbon has, um, it, it is gonna bond, has a four bond, a valent bond and so four. Um, and so uh, here we see it bonded, double bonded to an oxygen and a single bond over there. And then there's a single bond over here to another carbon. So this is, this is what's called a carboxyl. If you have uh, this kind of arrangement over here, and this is, uh, uh, well, this, if, if they, they didn't show it here, but this would be an aromatic molecule over there. Um, it look, uh, looks like a benzene with some more stuff on it. So, and there are a lot of these different kinds of moieties. This is a phosphate group. Now, what's interesting about this over here, you see a phosphorus in the middle, one, you know, in theory, it's one double bonded hydrogen, in, or oxygen rather. In, in practice, these things have what are called resonance. It sort of rotates around. The bonds are a little more amorphous. But the notion is you've got a phosphate in the middle with uh, four um, hydrogens around it. Then you've got the, uh, with four oxygens around it. And 
Then you've got these hydrogens here. And these sort of come and go depending on the environment of the solution, what the pH is. So over here is, this is essentially the same molecule. We've changed state a little bit. We've got some, we, we don't see the hydrogens here. Presumably they, um, you know, we're uh, maybe at a uh, much higher pH, so the hydrogens aren't present. But it's essentially conceptually a lot of the same thing. And that's the advantage of a moiety, is it gives you this sort of fuzz factor. And so working in units of moiety allow you to do balance in a way that doesn't require the same level of detail. You've got these layers of abstraction. You can construct moieties of moieties. So you get this hierarchy available to you as well. So that's sort of the key innovation here is working in units of moieties. So mass balance and using what we've been calling moiety analysis, it's the same algorithm as with the atomic mass analysis. So here's, here's something that um, this is a, uh, um, a, a catalyzed reaction. Um, and in this particular case, we're, we're, we're phosphorylating a molecule it requires bonding to this uh, catalyst over here, uh, GAPDH. Um, I think it's gly glycyceride diphosphate dehydrogenase is the name of the um, is the name of the enzyme over there. We formed this bond over here as a complex. Now, um, because we've written this in a way, it wasn't those like C10, C12s. You can see what the molecules actually are. Uh, the constituents and it makes it a lot easier than to work in these units of moiety. So if I can, if I consider each one of these a separate moiety, I can count them here and then I can see them separately as constituents in this complex. I mean, it's really trivial if you look at it this way. Whereas if I did this in units of atoms, um, I'd probably have all sorts of challenges here just doing the accounting right for the atoms in this in these ten thousand atoms over here. And then also, I almost guarantee you we're talking about. I mean, like a um, um, uh, this phosphate here, this inorganic phosphate here, you know, it could be surrounded by magnesiums and there's all sorts of things I might have to account for. So, so that's the idea is if we work in moiety analysis, we don't have to worry about a lot of the details and potentially it's also more natural for the chemist. It makes it a little bit easier for us to be able to um, then figure out uh, where problems might lie if we're missing, if we have an imbalance. So the key challenge with this approach is that there exists um, an ecosystem of tools and databases for giving exact atomic formulas of modest sized molecules, you know, like on the order of like 100 atoms. Um, the bigger ones that really that it doesn't exist. Um, I mean, I guess at some level it does in a sort of fanciful way if you look at, you know, the, the pure product of like a uh, you know, tra uh, translating a protein and you don't consider, you know, post-translational -trans modifications. I mean, we can get that from databases like PDB, but it, it's not the reality of what you're, you're doing the reactions with. So, so if you have modest sized molecules, you know, metabolites, for example, you probably can do it. So for people who focus on just uh, metabolism, they ask the question, well, gee, you know, you're asking for something, now I have to expose the moiety structures. And so I don't have the tools to do that. How are you going to be competitive with what is? And those are great questions. And it's definitely a capability that needs to be developed. Um, you know, part of the counter argument is that, you know, with the atomic approach, atomic mass analysis, you're not going to get to scale, but, you know, certainly for doing what you could do today with metabolism. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Okay, but it turns out that many modelers who primarily are, are chemists in their, their, you know, their, their day jobs think in terms of chemical moieties already. And so when they write models, they write models with names that mean something. So if you're familiar with the MAPK, I'm not going to go into the details of what this is. It's an essential part of cell signaling. Um, which is basically letting the cell know about what's going on in its environment. So here's one particular model that was developed for MAPK. And you can see, as you start looking at these names, you notice some commonality. So we've got MAPK, which, and then we've got, you know, this uh, MAPK, and then it's combined with something else called MEC, and the little p's are, phosph uh, uh, are phosphorylation, so it's doubly phosphorylated. Um, this one is, we've got this, um, uh, uh, another element over here with the pH on, on the end, um, and so on. You see a variety of names that look pretty similar, but there are variations on them. And so just from the point of view of doing really simple string stuff, you can, all these names are generated 
from the following six, you know, what we, you know, sort of logical moieties. And technically, I don't know if a real chemist would call those moieties, but they're, they're part of the name structures. And so what we can do is we could decompose each one of these as part of a reaction using these moieties in place to just count them up and then do the kind of moiety, um, moiety analysis I just described before. And so that's basically what we proposed at this point is that I would say of that, there are a number of, of databases, I'll talk about one later on, that contain chem chemical reactions in a, a, a community standard um, called SBML, Systems Biology Markup Language. And I would say like on the order of 10% of the models um, are structured in a nice way so that you can do this pretty easily. So it, at least it, it sort of bootstraps things, gets people excited about whether or not this is something that makes sense. And so that um, could do something before like everything is in place with standards. Okay, so that's, that's one approach. What I've gone through at this point is really this sort of, what was the sort of like the most natural way to do this kind of error checking of models? Look for the balance, you know, do I actually have balance in terms of the units, you know, some sort of units, whether it's atomic mass or, or these moieties. But what happens if we don't know anything about the chemical structure? We just have something, you know, someone has written a, um, a model. Um, there's, and this is true historically, less and less true currently, but true historically, where they've written, you know, some complex model and involves a bunch of chemicals. Maybe, you know, this is like the one I said before, I, I showed you before. Um, these reactants, I, you know, unless there's some separate annotation, I have no clue about what these things are. You know, the question is, you know, is at this point, is this hopeless? Do we just say, yeah, well, look, I, you know, you got to rewrite it. And, and to some extent, there's a lot of validity to that because, um, you know, going back to the analogy with software, this is not a readable model. Um, this particular model, I think, has 800 reactions in it, a little over 800 reactions in it, all with these, you know, very unintuitive names for the, uh, the molecules, like C10 and C154. It turns out, and this is actually sort of an, a, a you know, very interesting idea. This is not our, our intuition, but it's something that um, a fellow called um, Alexander Gavorkin did in, uh, over a decade ago. What you can do, although you can't do strict mass balance, something clever that you can do is something called stoichiometric inconsistency. And, and here's the idea. See, if these are mass balanced, if each one of these are mass balanced, I may not know their individual masses, but a constraint that you've got here is that whatever those masses are, it has to be such that the mass on the left-hand side is going to be equal to the mass on the, the mass of the reactants has to be equal to the mass of the products. And that has to be consistent across the whole set of reactions. And um, he formulated this as, as a linear programming. I'm going to give you an analysis which is a little bit different, um, but gives you the intuition behind it. Also, sort of gives you some insight into of an approach we ended up taking. So, if you have a reaction like this one, C10 plus 154 is uh, transformed into 160. That tells you that you know by mass balance, assuming that the, this is a mass balance reaction, that C10 has to have a mass that's less than C160, and C154 has to be less than uh, C160. If I have something with what's called a uni-uni reaction, they're on the same on both sides, that gives me a tremendous amount of leverage because how I know that these masses are equal. And what I can do is basically make inferences then about the equalities and the inequalities of masses to show, for example, in this case, that it turns out that um, uh, C160, C86, and C154 all have the same mass. So if C80, C154 and C160 have the same mass, they can't have different masses as in up here. And so that's an inconsistency. That's a stoichiometric inconsistency. No. Anyway, that's, that's the approach, and this is sort of the, the idea that we use behind it, is uh, take advantages of the structure of, of the reaction. So as I mentioned before, the Gavorkian approach is to use the, do this as linear programming, um, and 
uh, basically you're solving a, a feasibility problem. You're showing that you cannot assign, you're searching for, it's really feasibility of the minimize is just there as a placeholder. It doesn't matter whether it's mineral or not. But what we're concerned about is the, the feasibility condition. So this is a vector of masses. Can you find a vector of masses such that, and this is what's called the stoichiometry matrix, such that you can, you balance all those reactions. And that's, that's really the trick there. Um, the problem with this approach, and this turns out to be surprisingly fast computationally, even for, as things scale into, you know, like 10,000 reactions. Uh, beyond that, it's probably not feasible. I mean, it, it actually, to solve the one with 10,000 reactions, I think it took us uh, three hours on a laptop, but, you know, not that you have to run this on a laptop, but, you know, it, can't, it does get it to be computationally intensive. Um, so um, the challenge with this is not the detection problem. The problem is once you've detected something in 10,000 reactions, which reactions are problematic? Can I, can I figure out which ones they are? And it really doesn't give you that insight. It just tells you, you failed the feasibility condition. And so that was really sort of our launching point is could we do something for this case of where there's no annotation, we don't know the chemical structures, could we do something that did the detection and also figured out which reactions we should be looking at, hopefully a small number of reactions. And that's this notion of what we call GAINS, graphical analysis of mass equivalent sets. And so it uses sort of a combination of some graph theory and some linear algebra to do this kind of analysis. So let's go back to this, to, um, well, I guess I actually changed examples. I guess this one's a little more convenient. So hopefully confusion's there. This is, this is a, a, a different signaling uh, kind of problem. Um, what I'll tell you is in terms of the names that were used here, which is sort of interesting, it, they used a subscript and then uh, the, uh, the end over here tends to be, mostly be, there's one exception, they aren't necessarily totally consistent, tells you where that molecule is. So in this case, it's in solution, presumably in the cytosol. Uh, here it's in the nucleus. Uh, those are the two there. And now they've got this underscore test over here, which I think has to do with um, you know, a particular molecule they were introducing, but that's the way they've structured it here. So if we take a look at this, one of the things that you can do as a starting point, I mentioned before that these uni-uni reactions like this one here tell you a lot about what's going on. Um, and so um, this is a uni-uni reaction and this one is and this one is. These indicate mass equivalences. And that's the first step in our algorithm is we come up with those mass equivalences because then we can essentially extract that and remove them. It, it was surprising to us in the database of, mo of uh, models that we were working with, one of the more popular ones called um, biomodels. Um, I would say um, you would find typically 40 percent or so of the reactions were these uni-uni reactions. So that was um, extremely, uh, extremely, gave us a lot of leverage here. And then uh, based on this, what we did, we have this annotation, a sort of a curly brace uh, annotation, uh, notation that indicates um, these are what we call the mass equivalent sets. Um, these are mass equivalent. So these two, there's no mass equivalent. These two have a mass equivalence over there. Okay, so and they're, they're implied by these uni-uni reactions and then by transitive closure, you, you get other ones still. So, uh, for example, over here, um, we see uh, this, we've actually have three that are related to one another because of um, uh, some of the uh, others that we've got there. So we've got this one here, which gets those two, and then we got this one up here, which brings in the third one, then we get transitivity. Okay, let's, yep, went too far. Okay, so now the second step in our algorithm is to construct what we call pseudo reactions. So what a pseudo reaction is, it's a combination of other reactions. I mean, it could be with other pseudo reactions, but let's just start with real reactions. And, and what it's doing is making the observation that if two reactions are mass balanced, if you, combine together the products and combine together the, the reactants, then you still have something with, should have be mass balanced because you combine together equal things. It's basically a, a, a summation of two equations. And it's exactly that kind of concept of like a, a linear combination. So here's an example of this. Um, let's take reactions two and three. You know, the, 
if you combine them together, again, this is, a, this is not chemically feasible. We're not making any statement there. This is just for our analysis. So, um, so here's PSTAT and here's stat nuke. So PSTAT and stat nuke, and here's um, down here uh, stat sol, and then we've got PSTAT sol and, and species test. So you can see those over there. So we combine those together, and the observation is if the original ones were mass balanced, then these should also be mass balanced because we're just combining equalities. Um, and then we can take this further step of saying, okay, well, we've got these max, these mask equivalent uh, sets. And so we can actually use those instead of the reaction itself. I mean, as long as it's going to be pseudo, let's, let's go all out with pseudo. Let's throw in the max. So that's what we've got over here uh, in terms of you know, additional uh, sets over there. Okay, so, so now we've got this set of what we call pseudo reactions. And the last part, oh, and a um, key observation here is that a, uh, a pseudo reaction, and it's a bit of a, you know, negatives going on here. It's actually, if you're familiar with proof by contradiction, that's really what's going on. This is the contrapositive. So a pseudo reaction is not mass balance. In other words, we've detected a stoichiometric inconsistency um, only if um, at least one of its constituent, react, its constituent reactions is not mass balanced. So if that makes sense. So, so what it's showing you is that if you, if you find you know, an imbalance here, then you know there has to be an imbalance in one of the constituent reactions, so the original reaction set. Now, if you're astute about this, you'll notice that, well, wait a second, that's not a sufficient condition. In other words, it doesn't guarantee me that if I have a mass imbalance, I will find it through this technique, and that's true. And we have a certain rate of false negatives by doing this. Um, and that, that was okay for us. I mean, it turns out we were able to get that fairly low, like it was 2% of the models we're looking at. But the, the main thing is that we're not claiming that this is the right detection technique. You know, you, you can use the, um, the linear programming approach. What we're saying is this gives you a way of isolating, figuring out which re reactions you should look at. Okay, so the last step in this process is to infer the stoichiometric inconsistencies. And basically, you know, what we're trying to do is say that the set of, of reactions in this model ultimately causes you to either create or destroy mass. That, that's really what a stoichiometric inconsistency means, is that you, you somehow, you have to have some zero mass or give zero mass to some molecule. And it ultimately means then you're creating mass out of nothing because you have, you know, um, you, you have chemical species in there that have no mass. Okay, so um, here, here's an example of what the end result might be. Here are three of these pseudo reactions from that previous example. And the observation is that I can do a linear combination of these reactions. And what I come up with is, you know, on the left-hand side, I've eliminated all chemical species, all molecules. There's no molecule there. And on the right-hand side, I do have something I've created, yeah, I've created mass. So that's a stoichiometric inconsistency. And the observation here is that by doing this, being able to do this detection, this is done through standard um, uh, linear algebra techniques. Um, yeah, the, the paper contains a lot of details. So I'm not gonna go through the mathematics here. But um, what it tells you is it's these three pseudo reactions that cause the problem. So we just sort of recurse our way backwards and say, okay, so if it's these three, what constituents are there for these reactions? Well, we've got these, you know, the uni-uni reactions that forms the max, and then any other combinations uh, that, of other reactions that led to those uh, pseudo reactions. And that's the way we can do the uh, identification. Basically, instead of looking at all 800 or 10,000 reactions, you can look at a small subset. And typically, I mean, there's some cases where, you know, our subsets are not small, but for the most part, we're finding that it's on the order of three or five reactions that you look at instead of several hundred or several thousand. Um, so it clearly is an improvement in that regards. And um, what we do, um, we, we develop software, open source software, I'll show you in a minute if, if you're interested, if there's somebody out there who does you know, chemical modeling, uh, you can use this, we encourage that. Um, and this is the kind of, of report that you get, is you, it, it shows you, you know, what are the set of chemical species involved, um, which are the, uh, the, the reactions that are involved through this um, reaction isolation set, and finally the explanation of how it actually comes to pass that uh, this is, um, uh, yields a stoichiometric inconsistency. 
I mentioned another thing that in passing, a reason why you really want to be able to do isolation and not just detection. I mean, clearly being able to remediate, you know, a model requires uh, some something in the way of, um, you know, being to isolate things a bit, and you don't want to look at all, you know, 800,000, 10,000 reactions. But the other part of it is that many of these techniques uh, involve uh, a certain amount of numerically intensive computing, a lot of the linear algebra, for, for example, involves matrix manipulations, including taking, uh, you know, matrix inverses. And there can be numerical errors, especially, de you know, depending on, um, some of the stoichiometries, that's these numbers in front. Um, so that we were finding with linear algebra, for this linear algebra approach, for example, the linear programming approach, um, we were getting things that it detected an error, but we could never validate that that error was present. And we always wondered if, in fact, it was a linear, it, it was a numerical issue. It was not a, a true error in the reaction. And so one of the nice things about this kind of an explanation is it's really easy to check that yes, you know, yay, verily, this is a problem because I can, you know, create mass from nothing. Okay. All right, so uh, the kinds of things that we looked at, um, I mentioned this uh, repository of uh, biochemical models called BioModels. Um, they have a number of different formats. Um, the main things that we were interested in were the curated models because these were ones that, you know, human beings had actually looked at. That there are a number that are generated automatically, like um, if you're familiar with BioPsych, it, it has a bunch of tables that it uses uh, from, from various sources and they generate automatically models they use to populate this repository. We were less interested in those because it wasn't clear that a human being had ever done anything to check them. Uh, so we looked at really only the curated models um, there are a couple of variants on our algorithm, gives you some sense of timing on this. And then coverage is the fraction of the errors detected by the linear programming approach that we also detect, because obviously we're not gonna do problem isolation for a problem we don't detect. And so, like I said before, we were, you know, the, the more advanced algorithm, which obviously took a bit longer, like three seconds for on the average for the models, um, you know, also had um, fairly high coverage, only about 2% of the models could we not detect. And again, I don't even know if those were real errors because, you know, we could check the linear programming approach. There's a separate repository that we also looked at, uh, the BioModels models, I'll go back there just for a second. These typically, I think the high end was like 2000 reactions was the largest model in um, these, this quote, big model. Um, it's, it's actually at models of, for, for metabolics. Um, it's a mod, uh, met, metabolism models. Um, these went up to 10,000. That's the biggest model that I've seen. Um, and these, you know, clearly we took a lot longer here uh, so we're talking about, for example, you know, our algorithm on the 10,000 model, it took almost seven hours to, to run that. So, you know, they got a long time. It was about, you know, to, to put that in context, you know, linear programming took three hours. So, you know, it's, it's a big model. Um, and, and we found, you know, here's an example of these are the number of stoichiometric inconsistencies that we found. You know, so that's still a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, these are actually reactions that, um, we, we look at, so that's still a lot, but um, it, it, you know, at least we're, uh, it shows that there's some work to do in terms of refining this a bit to, to make it more usable. Uh, I mentioned before that we do have a GitHub repository. Um, this is broader project called Model Engineering, which I made brief reference to at the beginning, this notion of applying ideas from software engineering to uh, biomedical models. And SBML Lint is the name of the software project we use uh, basically, it's a linter for the standard SBML. And so, and it has some examples of, of usage of this. Um, it has both command line, if you use Jupyter Notebooks, we, we have something for that too. So, so this is a summary about you know, what I tried to cover. Um, I know it's probably likely that many, you know, most of you even are, are not you know, dealing with the details of you know, reaction-based bottles and biological systems, but it gives you some sense about you know, maybe some creative ways that you might think of modeling in your, um, your domain, you know, your, your area of expertise and what, what error checking might be. Yeah. Okay, well, let me stop there. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, I'll do a little, really 
bring up your applause reactions if you'd like to. <laughs> you can get a little reaction. All right, I'll do, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll do yay. some next to my microphone. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, I actually you, still have more was... people than when we started, so that's that's encouraging. Yes, yes. You yeah. you built up rather than went down. I built so up that's... rather than not. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. That was a really wonderful talk. Um, so if folks have questions, um, again, um, you should have a little blue icon with it. it looks like a hand raised um, and you can click on that and I'll um, as those come in I'll acknowledge you and you can ask a question. Um, while we're waiting for um, people to come in with those, um, Joe I was wondering so you know you've identified I'm wondering you know for the people who have contributed models to these various um, databases of models um, you know, have you reached out to any of them? Like, is there interest in then, you know, folks going back and revisiting the models based on these errors? Or is, is that part of the trajectory of this? Or is that really for them to do on their own based on this, the, this, this new resource that they would have available? Uh, we did a little bit of that in the beginning. Um, and I think what largely um, goes on is that um, they, the models are tested and evaluated for uh, a certain experimental purpose. And, you know, they, they, you know, they do have, the, with the curated models, they do, there is an, a, a process whereby they try and verify that the figures, these are all, all, all models are associated with the publication. And then they verify that the, the, the figures in the publication can be generated from the model. And, and I think that that's sort of their perspective is, you know, yes, okay, you're right, but you know, um, it does, you know it, it's right in the context of our paper. And you know, our, our feeling about it is that this is still a bit of a problem because typically the way new models are developed is someone starts with an, an existing model. And there's sort of like, you know, um, user beware issue there if there's not a way of doing that. That sort of a broader thing is that there is a grant that um, Herb Saro in bioengineering got for what's called a reproducibility center where they would provide more in the way of curation tools for models. And so there's a thought that maybe this tool might be something that would be available in that context. And so, you know, models are admitted to that repository would go through extra checks. Right, that sounds great. Or that people, I know somehow getting out to the community that's producing and working and iterating on these models, that there are the a tool like yours or other tools that are developing so that they don't get to the point of like it being in the, the publication and okay, great, it's reproducible, but there's these probably these inherent errors that people aren't going to know about. So um, that sounds great. Okay, I'm going to, we've got a question here. Um, let's see, Matt Johnson, um, if you want to unmute yourself, please go ahead. Hi, thanks for uh, the interesting talk. It was super cool. Um, it's a little bit outside of my area, but I was curious if in your experience, there's anything that you, if you got to add something to the way that people define models or the way that they are communicated, is there something like small and easy that you would add? So I'm thinking like a new programming languages, right? The concept of right. like, types or type safety um, or something like that. Is there like a low hanging fruit thing that you wish like, gosh, all these biochemists should just use this? Yeah, you know, so this is pretty low level stuff, mass balance. And I think for mass balance, you know, knowledge of chemical structure, you know, something that's structured as you know, like moieties is, you know, sort of low hanging fruit, you know, especially if you're a chemist, that's sort of a natural thing. But, um, you know, when you think about a mechanistic model and something you're trying to sort of, you know, then look at, well, what is the sort of counterpart of a unit test, like for software, you're probably talking about, you know, sort of the, the time course of like, you know, concentrations of, of, you know, species, chemical species over time, and be able to make assertions about, you know, this should rise until that falls. You know, something like that, that you, you know, have assertions about how the chemical system should behave. I should see an e increasing concentration of, you know, dissolved methane until the concentration of dissolved oxygen reaches a certain level. Something like that, I think, would be helpful because then that's sort of stating your intended purpose. And then an automated system could see, in fact, if that comes to pass. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Matt. Other questions?
I'd be curious if, if someone wants to volunteer, not you know, you know, sort of only indirectly on this topic, but about others who were doing, and many people raised their hands doing modeling. And I'd be curious to know about challenges people face with trying to check for the correctness of their models. Because I'm doing this in one particular domain and I picked one particular aspect of it. But I think there's a broad challenge for people who are developing models about, you know, there's the obvious things about, you know, um, uh, you know obviously if the implementation software part, that's fine. Or um, there may be, you know, uh, numerical checks in terms of like singularities, you know, in a, a regression matrix. But I didn't know if other people, you know, had other thoughts along this lines because I'm curious to hear what happens in other domains. So I don't know if Anyone? Daniel is raising his hand or. Um... Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, looking... I'm, I'm oh, trying great. to, oh, but okay. I can okay. find That's fine. That's good enough. Come hey, on, sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm looking at the little, the, the actual little hands that come up the yeah, participant thing. I don't have everybody in the window, but please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so I, I, our lab actually generates a lot of this metabolism data. And so this was a really interesting talk, but, um, you know, in terms of the possibilities of things we could do, our challenge is, and, and you know, we don't, uh, work a lot in modeling. We're just kind of getting started in that. We, we tend to do a lot of multivariate statistical analysis on our data as opposed to metabolic modeling. But one challenge that we have is that, you know, the type of data, the, the instrument platforms that we use for measuring metabolism, we can generate, you know, several hundred metabolites, maybe on, up to a thousand. We can generate fluxes, a, a much smaller number, but, but still quite useful for mechanistic studies. But the models that we you know, the data that we generate often doesn't, don't fit the, the models that are already available. So there's a lot of missing data. And that's, you know, a challenge for us is how to use what we have and sort of bootstrap on models that are available. So we're gonna have to start from scratch. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how, how to approach that kind of problem. Yeah, that's a great question because it's certainly in biology, there's so much, so much of our knowledge that's missing things that we don't know, um, especially if you're doing anything with kinetics models, what are the kinetics constants? That's sort of like black hole almost. Uh, there's sometimes, and, and in what context, if you use the numbers, in what, you know, in what chemical context were they obtained? And that makes a huge difference as well. Um, and the other huge problem in biology is, is just wrong information. You know, it, databases that just don't contain the correct stuff. So um, I, I'm more, um, I guess, just griping with you right now, Daniel. <laughs> but I mean, actually just separately, I'd be curious to follow up with you and sort of dig into a little more detail and understand more about what you're doing, see if there is something else that might be useful. Sure, no, I'll, I'll send you an email after this so we can- Okay, thank you very much. Any other final comments? We're um, actually a, a bit over time, but if anybody has a last burning question, um, please either use the little hand or just raise your hand like this and <laughs> or just start talking. Actually, you can just unmute yourself if you have a quick question. Okay. Yeah, well, um, I'm not, not seeing anything, but please feel free. Um, uh, Joe Hellerstein um, it, it holds um, office hours on a regular basis, and you can find his contact information on our website if you do want to follow up with him, or feel free to reach out to me, and I'm happy to help connect you. Um, this is a space he's very passionate about and, and has made a lot of really wonderful developments, I think, and um, kind of um, pushed uh, this community in a, in a different direction or in a, a promising direction based on you know, his experience and background. And that's been really exciting to, to see. So thank you, Joe, for sharing that with us today. Um, thank you. And, and actually for everyone, feel free to um, email me directly. It's um, J.L. Heller, H-E-L-L-E-R, at uw.edu. I, I have no concern that I'll be overwhelmed. I rarely get much in the way of feedback. So don't hesitate. Don't feel like you're, you're you're imposing. I would love to be able to understand what others are doing. 
Great, Joe. Well, thank you. And this talk will be posted if you want to revisit it. This talk is being recorded and we'll have this posted uh, both on the community um, seminar page and also on the eScience YouTube channel. Um, we'll have a little delay on that, but it'll be headed in that direction. So thank you all again for joining okay. and, and thank you again, Joe. Uh, my pleasure and thank you very much. Okay.